Pregnancy Forum. My name is Carol Werner and I am uh, serving on the, st the steering committee once again for this uh, Expo, Congressional Technology Expo and Policy Forum and I'm also the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, uh, a, a longtime member and, and one of the founders of the Sustainable Energy Coalition. And we are very pleased to be presenting this whole uh, Expo and Policy Forum in conjunction with the House and Senate Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency uh, Caucuses, as well as a number of other congressional caucuses that are listed on the program. Uh, and hopefully you will be going through all of the, the exhibits at the Expo, as well as listening and learning from so many of our speakers during this forum. So, want to get this underway, and in our first panel this morning, we're going to be taking an overview of policy issues. Our lead off will be Scott Sklar, who is the president of the Stella Group. He is also an adjunct professor at George Washington University and the chair of the Sustainable Energy Coalition. Scott. Hey, thank you very much, and thank you all for uh, coming today, and thank you ESI for sponsoring this. Um, I always like to start off uh, th this uh, because my company, I blend all these clean energy technologies together all over the world uh, for industrial, commercial, and the U.S. military. And I like to sort of give you the trend analysis for all these technologies. So as of the end of 2013, Bloomberg Energy uh, came out with their study that shows that um, $254 billion of private sector investment uh, in renewables uh, occurred, and that is dwarfed by over a trillion dollars of government investments across the globe in renewable energy and energy efficiency. In addition, at the end of 2013, the Energy Information Administration said for all new power in the United States for 2013, domestic renewable energy accounted for 37.16%. So over a third of our new electricity coming online uh, was the blend of renewable energy technologies. And actually 2012 was higher. It was over 50%. So uh, we're finally starting to see a turnaround similar to what happened when cellular technology started overtaking in new communications the wired technology of which it competed with. Employment impacts are also pretty high around the country. And there are, we have a whole table in front of the caucus room of different energy and employment studies, economic studies, at the state or regional level of the United States. I brought one such study out here on the front table that is uh, all of the United States. But basically, for $1 million spent on energy efficiency, uh, you're, you're creating 2.5 to 8.9 jobs. For renewables, it's um, one and a half to 7.5 jobs. These are huge, very high ratio in job creation. And unlike the traditional industries, which are, the jobs are concentrated at the resource, the coal mine, the natural gas site, uh, these jobs are spread mostly at the user site where you're installing it, if it's in residential buildings or commercial buildings or along the grid. So they're much more geographically dispersed. Now I also teach two interdisciplinary courses on sustainable energy at George Washington University. And I also have outside the, uh, the 29 studies that I ask my students to read. I'm not asking you or will I test you on those 29 studies, but I do want to provide some impacts. When I come here, I talk about the Google study that showed the United States could meet all its energy needs uh, for about uh, $4 trillion worth of private sector investment, and we would reap $5.8 trillion back in savings. Uh, so there's the NREL uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory combined lab study, which shows that the blend of renewables and high value energy efficiency we have today can meet most of our energy needs. But I want to talk to you about the four newest ones that came on from last year. Uh, one was um, developed by an energy analysis paper developed by the Energy Information Administration, which shows that the methane potential from landfill, animal manure, wastewater, industrial processes, 
and other organic wastes could meet uh, about 56% uh, of our natural gas consumption. We have a lot of methane that's going in the atmosphere, and as you know, methane is a far more potent, though shorter term, greenhouse gas than carbon. Uh, the Nicholas Institute from Duke University also looked at decentralized biogas, and they put out a study in March, and they said that, uh, th that this, uh, this gas could beat about 15% of our natural gas use, 5% in the short term. Um, there is also a uh, hydropower study that was done uh, by Department of Energy Assessment that we could bring on 12 gigawatts from existing non-powered dams um, that would have with new ultra low impact designs and um, 12 gigawatts is sort of 12 nuclear power per plants worth of power of course it's 24 hour power and then Columbia University study group um, uh, their research arm just finished a study in July of this year that said uh, organic waste so this is and again this is not incineration this is using waste for gasification, separating it out, so you're only using the stuff that biodegrades to methane, could meet 12% of U.S. electricity needs. So a lot on the, on the other technologies, and again, that's the marine and water and, and biomass, and of course there's geothermal, that tend to be overlooked since everybody's talking about solar and wind. Finally, um, I spent a lot of time, I was just at a White House meeting uh, this week on resiliency, meaning how do you maintain or sustain the U.S. electric grid from terrorism, from earthquakes, ge geologic events, storms, uh, and many of us who were involved in this uh, starting in the 1970s before climate change ever showed on the, on the screen have been looking at this whole resiliency issue. And, you, and the only way to achieve real resiliency is just what we've done in the telephone sector. We have a distributed communications arm, it's called cellular, and that's what you're going to need as well. For cybersecurity, you're going to need distribution and redundancy because your grid, can, your grid is going to be attacked and has been attacked more than 7,000 times according to a report right up here in Congress. So there's a real essential for those of you that are interested on in the national security side and on just the resiliency of critical functions to look at these objectives in terms of how you look at your state, how you look at your, 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 your political issues uh, regarding uh, security. Finally, I want to point out to you and I point out to my students that blended technology solutions are really the best way to do that, putting all your eggs in any one technology, and that is including renewables, uh, a renewable is not the way to go. The way to go is to optimize, to have elegant blending of technologies. And that gives you greater choice. It allows the market to have uh, better options. It allows the consumer to have lower cost power over time. And definitely uh, where we have seen states that allow the entire portfolio of energy efficiency and renewables you have less swings in rates, less surprises, and that's really critical to, for our economy. Because the less you spend on energy, guess what? That means you have more to spend on other things. And so that's really our, our, our goal here from a policy perspective. So with that, thank you. That's sort of the opening trends. And next year, these industries, efficiency and renewables, should grow another 11% and I think uh, should uh, sort of top half a trillion dollars in private se sector investment when you blend efficiency and renewables together. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Scott. And it is very exciting to see all of these things come together and how strong they and diverse they can make our whole system when, as Scott says, we really blend and optimize. And to hear a little bit more along that theme as we think about the, what is underway with the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, we're going to hear from Zoe Berkery, who is the manager for federal policy for BCSE, the Business Council for Sustainable Energy. Zoe? Thank you so much for all of you being here today. Like Carol said, I am Zoe Berkery, Manager of Federal Policy for the Business Council for Sustainable Energy. 
I know some of you in the audience have, um, it's a slide deck, that the first half in my brief remarks doesn't really matter, but towards the end I have a couple graphs that I'll reference so it might be useful to check it out. There are some outside on the table if you missed it. So first of all, I'm going to talk about what the Business Council for Sustainable Energy does and then switch gears to talk about the Sustainable um, Energy in America Factbook that we do every year with Bloomberg New Energy Finance. So about the BCSE. BCSE is a coalition of companies and trade associations from the renewable energy, energy efficiency, and natural gas sectors. The Council advocates for policies at the state, national, and international levels. A little bit more about what we do at each of these levels. At the state level, we actively engage annually with the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, or NARUC. Just earlier this month, we were in Dallas, Texas at their summer meeting where we hosted one of our clean energy industry breakfasts, which is basically a forum for our clean energy industry executives, our membership, as well as um, public utility commissioners um, to engage and network and focus, uh, talk about the issues from a variety of perspectives. And then we usually bring in a guest speaker. We were lucky enough to have um, Janet McCabe with the EPA speak at this breakfast this year. Um, additionally, federal policy, we're always on the Hill meeting with a variety of offices. Some hot topics lately have been um, tax extenders, appropriations, um, and then often it's a specific piece of legislation like Shaheen Portman, for example. At the international level, we engage with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and go to their Conference of the Parties meetings annually. This year we'll be in Lima, Peru, which will hopefully um, be a meeting gearing up for the next year's meeting in Paris in 2015, where hopefully a cl new climate agreement to replace Kyoto will come out of it. Um, so we help, we are a portion of their private sector business um, ob observation members there. And finally, on the international level, the Climate Technology Center and Network just recently accepted BCSE as a member of their network. So we'll be working with them to consult on bringing clean energy technologies to other parts of the world. Um, so broadly, BCSE advocates for policies that promote clean, efficient, and sustainable energy products, technologies, and services. Um, we have a broad membership, about 51 members at the moment. Um, in the slide deck, there's um, a, a page that shows all of our member logos. And actually, that membership is split up fairly evenly into thirds, renewables, efficiency, and natural gas. So now switching gears a bit and going to talk about the Sustainable Energy in America Factbook that we've done the last two years in partnership with Bloomberg New Energy Finance. And actually, the first um, uh, fact that Scott brought up with the, the um, over $254 billion being invested in clean energy technologies actually came from this report. And what the fact book aims to do is to, pro to provide up-to-date, accurate market intelligence about the broad range of industries, energy efficiency, renewable energy, and natural gas, that are contributing to the country's move towards cleaner energy production and more efficient energy usage. So then there's a little bit of a Snapchat, a snapshot. <laughs> <laughs> slip of the tongue, um, snapshot on what the fact book does and some high level um, facts that came from it and some that I just picked out to share with you today um, are that renewable energy uh, generation, including large hydro, grew from 8 to 13 percent of U.S. mix over the 2007 to 2013 period. The cost of solar PV has come down 80 percent since 2008 and I also read that it's down 99 percent since 1973. So we've made huge strides. Um, as well as distributed generation is emerging more and more as a really transformative phenomenon in the energy sector. Um, and total energy use has fallen 5% while GDP has grown 6% um, over that same period, 2007 to 2013, and there's more on that coming. So the first graph um, on slide 10, if you're, if you're checking it out, that last fact I just said about energy use falling 5% while GDP has grown 6%. This is a really big um, kind of deviation from what we've seen in the past, whereas usually as GDP goes up, so does energy consumption. But um, there's been a lot of advances in energy efficiency in the transportation, power generation, and building sectors. And so due to that, um, we're actually seeing energy consumption come down even as GDP is growing. Um, the next graph on page 11, or slide 11 shows um, U.S. electricity generation by fuel type, showing that mix and how it's changing um, year by year. Renewable generation, like I said, has grown from 8.3 to 12.9 over the 2007 to 2013 period. And a really significant point um, is that since 1997, 94% of all new power capacity built in the U.S. has come in the form of renewable energy facilities or natural gas. 
Um, and then there's a slide on U.S. investment in clean energy. And like Scott has touched on, and like I mentioned as well, that figure, over $250 billion over the last five years invested in clean energy from um, uh, the private sector is really staggering. Um, and actually Bloomberg found that in their global index of companies active in the renewables and low carbon energy um, technologies gained 53.9%, which largely overshadowed the gains um, seen in S&P 500 companies and the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So this last graph on page um, slide 13 shows U.S. greenhouse gas emissions from the energy sector. Um, and economy-wide. So the first line shows just carbon dioxide coming from the energy sector alone, um, which you can see is a huge portion of it. Then the, the top kind of squiggly line shows total greenhouse gas emissions as well as the trajectory of what Obama's goal was of setting, um, of reducing emissions by 17% below 2005 levels by 2020. And we were actually already halfway to meeting that at 9.8% decrease since that was set. And as I'm sure many of you know, with the proposed clean power plan out now, that is set to, um, as it is proposed, to bring um, emissions down 30% below 2005 levels by 2030. Um, so we'll see, again, that's a proposed rule. So we'll see what the finalized one looks like. And so the next slide just shows um, the Sustainable Energy in America Factbook website. There's quick links there to, to download the full Factbook or jump to energy um, sector specific sections or get even more specific if you want to know more about fuel cells or, or offshore wind. Um, then let's see. And then so wrapping up, one last plug. Business Council for Sustainable Energy is on social media. Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook. We're constantly posting updates and useful tidbits. So thank you. Great, Zoe, thank you. And if you want, just make sure we have the slide deck. We'll post it sure. with, the, with the video for, uh, for today and everything because there was a lot of very good information there, um, just as with all of the studies that Scott is talking about. So now we're going to turn to Lena Moffitt, who is the manager for Federal Policy, Climate, and Energy for the National Wildlife Federation for another perspective and uh, with regard to policy and looking at their priorities. Lena? Best system of emissions reduction for our power sector. 
and they decided that that best system of emission reduction has a pretty broad net. So they, they put this into four buckets. The first is achieving what, what we refer to as inside the fence line reductions of emissions at the power plant. So heat rate reductions at current coal and uh, natural gas fired power plants. The second is a redispatch to natural gas, which I'm sure you all are very familiar with. The third is increasing reliance on renewable energy, which we think is very exciting and that this was one of the key areas where National Water Federation has been advocating over the past decade to push environmental, environmental protection agencies and then the final uh, is an increased reliance on demand side energy efficiency, which is very exciting. So in the clean power plant, we're really at a key uh, point in time. As if you all are probably aware, the comment period is currently open. The standard has been released. Uh, and they just held public hearings across the country. It's still going on this week. I'm sure many of you were down there, as we all were, I think, uh, testifying. You were testified, but the three of us were testifying earlier this week at EPA in support of the Clean Power Plan, and I think there's a real opportunity uh, for your businesses and if there are staff and members in Congress even uh, to offer written technical comments before the comment period closes on October, October 16th. And I think there are a couple of key areas that if you are a renewable energy company or energy efficiency company, you want to really be sure to highlight. Uh, when EPA set this those four building blocks to establish targets for each state. And they did that by looking at what's the potential for each of those four building blocks to reduce pollution in those four states, in those four blocks it was for each state. We believe that some of the assumptions that they included about the potential for renewable energy and energy efficiency in many of the states were set far too low. And that resulted in uh, many of the state targets, they set 49 state targets, Vermont is excluded because they don't have any coal and natural gas fired power plants. Too low. And we believe that that will leave a lot of emissions reduction on the table. So one of the key uh, opportunities is to submit comments that, you know, you guys are the experts here. Demonstrate to EPA there are more resources, there's more potential for renewable energy and energy efficiency than they assume in setting those standards. We hope they'll listen to advocates like the National Wildlife Federation and the industry experts like yourselves. And when we see the final standard, it will be even tighter, which will incentivize even more renewable energy and energy efficiency. So that's the first key opportunities, weighing in with EPA before October 16th. Then there's an inflection point. They are set to finalize the standard by June 15th, uh, I'm sorry, by June of 2015, next year. And after that happens, the, the ball is really in the state's court. So we believe there's a key opportunity for you all to work with your state air regulators to make sure that they're implementing the Way. The, the great thing about this standard uh, is that it really does offer a lot of flexibility to states. So there's a lot of opportunity to advocate with your state regulators to determine how they're going to implement this standard. Uh, we want, uh, the National Wildlife Federation wants to make sure that states really take advantage of those last two building blocks by truly calling on renewable energy resources and energy efficiency resources in their state. They don't have to. Uh, so we would love to see you work with your state air regulators to really say, we have this opportunity in our state to use these resources, let's make sure they're actually used. One thing I forgot to mention, apologies, uh, on the comment period, EPA didn't include in consideration a couple of very key renewable energy resources that we believe should have been included. One is offshore wind, because EPA was being uh, pretty cautious in how they set the standard, they only looked at existing technology in the United States. Now, offshore wind is very much an existing technology in Europe. They've got a lot of offshore wind. We don't have it here yet, at least this year, in the United States, so they didn't include that for consideration. That's a key thing we think should be included because we know we are going to develop our offshore wind research. The other is distributed solar power. We believe that's a, a clear opportunity that should have been considered as well, and, and we hope that they do in the final standard. So I see I'm getting the two-minute uh, mark here. So I'll move on to the production tax credit very key opportunity in the next few months to advocate with Congress. Uh, so it's a different audience, and maybe we have some congressional staffers in the audience, you guys know this. The, these credits are critical to the continued growth for our onshore and offshore renewable energy industry. We're allowed to expire last year, I'm sure you all know this. We're very much hoping that they can be reinstated in the lame duck session. That seems like it's going to be the most likely time for this to happen after the election. 
but it's in no way a done deal. Uh, Congress absolutely needs to hear from you and your companies if these credits are critical and must be extended. The fossil fuel industry has enjoyed a century of about $4 billion a year of federal incentives. The production tax credit is less than that uh, and critical for this non community industry. So we really hope it's included in that package at the end of the year, but they need to hear from you to ensure that it is. So happy to work with uh, all of you on any of these opportunities and we'd love to answer questions afterwards. Great. Thanks so much, Lena, for covering some really, really key issues and um, and good to hear about everything that you're doing on offshore wind uh, coupled with that. And so now for the, our last person on this particular panel is Tom Carlson, who is with Advanced Energy Economy, a very interesting group, relatively new, uh, but doing a lot of uh, terrific things at the state level. And Tom is the Government Affairs and Policy Associate. And uh, AW is a national association of businesses making the energy we use clean, secure, and affordable. Um, we actually work, we work with the uh, Business Council for Sustainable Energy on a number of issues. Um, one of the things that AW also does is we meet a state coalition consisting of 15 partner organizations active in 23 states across the country. And uh, together, the network represents more than 1,000 companies and organizations across the United States. Uh, we represent companies working across the advanced energy spectrum, energy efficiency, demand response, natural gas electricity generation, solar, wind, hydropower, nuclear, smart grid, and energy storage. Um, I know today throughout the day you're going to hear from folks talking about all these different segments. Um, and you've heard um, Zoe and Scott talk about all the investments happening both in this country and worldwide in renewable energy. We put out a report, um, this is the second year we put it out, this is our Advanced Energy Now 2014 market report, where we looked at trying to get a look at the, the revenue of the advanced energy companies, how much revenue were these companies generating. And what we found is last year in 2013, advanced energy reached over $1.1 trillion in estimated global revenues. $1.1 trillion. That was a 7% increase from the And the US market made up 15% of the global market came in at about $168 billion. And that was up, up from um, the US market being 11% of the global market in 2011. So we're capturing, we've been capturing more of the global advanced energy market, which is, is a great thing. Um, and to put that in context, um, advanced energy globally is bigger than uh, the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical manufacturing worldwide. And it's about, in the United States, it's equal to the airline industry. So it's a, it's a significant industry, and it's growing. I um, just want to talk about three things briefly. One, the historic role of the federal government in energy. Um, number two, the role of states in driving energy innovation and how this could continue under EPA's uh, carbon, uh, um, I'm sorry, clean power plant reducing carbon emissions in the power sector. And then number three, um, lessons uh, that we can take from the states to apply to federal policy. Um, so just starting out, historically, the federal government has played a pivotal role in promoting energy innovation. And this, in turn, has driven economic progress. Going back to 1926, Congress created a percentage depletion allowance for oil and gas exploration in the western U.S. And this is still part of our tax code today. In the 50s, the federal government was critical to commercializing nuclear. And now, recently, um, the Department of Energy Research into shale gas, dating back to the 70s, has helped lead to the, the boom we're seeing in the industry today. So federal policy has continued to be critical, um, but we've seen states recently really take the lead as energy pioneers. One of the first renewable portfolio standards was created in Texas in 1999 when George W. Bush was still governor. And today, 29 states have, have RPS laws. Together, these states have a combined population of over 200 million people, and that would make them the fifth largest country in the world. 25 states have energy efficiency resource standards. And this makes up 60% of electricity sales in this country. According to ACEEE, um, if each of these states maintains its current target out of 2020, then the total annual savings would be equivalent to 6% of our projected 2020 sales nationwide. That would be the combined electricity consumption of Ohio, Minnesota, and Rhode Island. So we're clearly states are driving the way here. 
And under, again, under GPA's um, clean power plan, which Lena talked quite a bit about, um, this is an opportunity um, for states to use policies like these to reduce emissions and also modernize our electric grid, a lot of, of what Scott was talking about. You not only do we reduce emissions, the same kinds of technologies can, bring, can make our grid more resilient and more secure. Um, so EPA gave a lot of flexibility to states um, to, and, and in, in developing their emission reduction plan. And we believe actually as the, the draft rule is set, these targets are easy to achieve. And we were testifying, I was testifying yesterday uh, before the EPA said we were very supportive of the carbon standards and we actually think they can be strengthened um, based on our actual resource potential for both energy efficiency and renewable energy. Um, and, and natural gas and nuclear is both, they're both going to play a big role here as well. Um, so states have a lot of experience already, as we mentioned. In addition to RPS and DRS laws, you've also have cap and trade programs in some parts of the country, in California, and the regional gas emissions, gas, regional greenhouse gas emissions in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic state. That's another option states can look to. Um, so despite all the great activity at the states, we still need Congress to act. Um, if we want to maximize our benefits from advanced energy. Um, at the close of 2013, um, Lena also mentioned um, a number of advanced energy tax credits expired. In addition to the production tax credit, there's credits for advanced transportation, energy efficiency, a smarter grid. And you know, with these, with support of these technologies, we've seen a lot of deployments in advanced energy. Um, and as Zoe mentioned, we've seen with this deployment, prices come down. Um, wind has fallen by 43% in price the last four years, solar by 60% in the last eight. We've had highly cost-effective energy savings. Um, we've also seen advanced biofuels begin to commercialize. On the, the flip side, um, with the production tax credit being there, not being there, being uncertain, we've seen the wind market go a little bit up and down. A report found that the wind, wind industry in the U.S. went from 13 billion in 2011, 25 billion in 2012, and then down to 2 billion in 2013. And that's all about the uncertainty around the production tax credit. Well, it's expired again, um, so we'll, we'll see what we do moving forward. But one thing that the federal government could learn from the states is the uh, importance of stability and continuity, continuity in energy policy. And if we want to really capture, continue capturing more of the global market, we need stability, we need to extend the tax credits at the federal level. Um, so where is that right now? Uh, the Finance Committee with bipartisan support passed the Expire Act, but it looks like we're going to have to wait until after the November elections to see, see extenders taken up. Now that's the key thing, that's the top priority. We need, we need to extend the current tax policy and tax credits we have on the books now that expire 2013. Looking forward, uh, Finance Chairman Ron Wyden and others in Congress have talked about the need for longer-term tax reform. Eight of the uh, worked with our business members, folks in Congress, congressional staff, and some people in this room to develop some principles around this. This is the last thing I'm going to mention here. So the key thing now is for Congress, we really need to extend the tax credit longer term, next year, and beyond. We're going to be talking about reform. We'd like to look at four things. Number one, be targeted. Let's talk about the goals that we want for our energy system whether it's greater cleanliness, resiliency, or security, and let's create a tax policy for the energy code that works towards that. And if, we are, if we're going to have phase-outs, let's tie phase-outs to market-based objectives for our energy system, as opposed to arbitrary calendar deadlines, which is what we have now. Um, the key thing is providing stability and certainty for businesses and investors. And a fourth thing we'd like to see is to be technology neutral. Um, so finally, states are you know, obviously going to continue drive energy innovation, but the federal government also continues to have, to have a key role as it's had historically in spurring an advanced energy economy. Um, so with that, definitely look forward to talking more with all of you today. Please stop by um, the AWE booth out there and we'd love to discuss more. Thanks so much, Tom. We've got a little, a couple minutes for questions. If anyone has a question or comment, or if there's anything else one of our speakers would like to say. Okay, and, oh, okay, question right here. Go ahead. But I'm curious if any of you are doing any work, oh, can people hear me now? Okay. 
Um, I'm curious if any of your companies or institutions are doing any work with energy potential and recovery from wastewater. I know that a lot of times when we talk about renewable energy, we're talking about renewable energy that actually is damaging to the environment in other ways. And there's a lot of advancements in technology and potential from wastewater. And wastewater is something that is harmful to both humans and the environment. So I'm just yeah, curious um, if there's I, been work. I on work that. with a lot of local governments on wastewater, both in the technology to clean it and then, of course, the technology, uh, the energy technology to run that, those kinds of um, advanced uh, water technologies. Um, what's m very interesting that, and I teach this in my courses too, is uh, about 18% of, of the grid east of the Mississippi is used to move water and sewage around and clean it. About 33% west of the Mississippi. The energy sector, by the way, is the largest user of water in the country. It dwarfs agriculture. Both together use 89% of the water, leaving 11% for everything else. There is not, a, our water use is not sustainable, so we can't waste it. So this fracking stuff, which, you, which uses water and then keeps it dirty, is not acceptable. So, uh, so there's a big issue here on both cleaning water, using water, moving water and sewage around. Lastly, our municipal water systems and also our water cleaning systems um, result in a lot of biosolids, meaning you're, you're scraping stuff out of it that's actually biodegradable, and it turns into methane. What we do around the country is we flare the gas. So we're, we're, we're burning it rather than, use, rather than scrubbing it and cleaning it for biogas, for energy use. So there's lots of elegances in here of not just wondering how we use water and what energy we use on it, but I, again, optimizing the whole process. Great. Um, thank you. And I think now I would encourage you to follow up with individual speakers, go meet them at their booths, uh, take a look at that. And, uh, and, and obviously, we also hope that you will take advantage of our next sessions in this policy forum. And we will start our next session in just a couple minutes. Thank you all. And thank you. Wonderful, wonderful panel. Thank you for starting this off so well.